everyone, it's Evelyn, and on this week's video we're going to discuss my top 10 cut flowers from last year. Now some of them are perennials, so see if you can keep track of which ones are perennials and which ones are annuals. And also, I need to make a disclaimer before I get going, because although I do sell daffodils and tulips, they're not going to make my top 10 cut flower list because I don't sell them as cut flowers. I'm going to explain all about that later on in the video as well. So let's get going. The top 10 are going to be arranged not in order of my preference, but in order of how they bloom. So the earlier uh, in the season they bloom, that's going to be the number one. The last ones that bloom will be number 10, give or take. Some of them bloom around the same time. First up is the camellia. I love camellias and they bloom really, really early. They're actually considered a winter flowering shrub. Now, if you look at my picture over here, you'll notice that my camellia bush is actually quite small. It stands only about four feet tall and maybe about six feet wide. But if you look at the lower picture, you can see that when it's blooming, it's absolutely loaded with blooms. So there's, even though it's not a big shrub, there's plenty of blooms to go around on that bush. And um, if you look at it in a bouquet arrangement, you'll see it's actually blooming at the same time as cherry blossoms start are starting up. And of course, cherry blossoms are the harbinger of spring. So this particular bouquet was made on April 19th, and it's paired again with the cherry blossoms, as well as some dried poppy pods and some deciduous branches that are just starting to leaf out with a green. And that little bit of leafy green mixed with that deep... Um, browny purple uh, leaf of the cherry blossoms really is a nice foil for that bright pink of the camellia. So the second on my list of uh, early spring blooming cut flowers is the rhododendron. Now the rhododendron makes my list for the same reason that the camellia does. It's really early on in the season. And if you look at this flower arrangement, I did this one on May 31st. And I've got it paired with some other flowers. I've got it paired with blue bachelor buttons as well as blue bluebells. Some pale pink flowers that sort of bloom the same way that Forsythe does, but it's not a Forsythe. I don't actually know what it is. I'm going to have to look that up this summer, take a, or this spring, pardon me, take a branch of it into one or two of the local garden centers and see if they can identify what it was. I didn't plant it. It was already existing when we bought our property eight years ago. Now, number three on my list are my Ito peonies, and they're really important for my uh, cut flower garden. And in fact, I bought them specifically for that. Now, you can't do a lot of good cutting on them until their third season, which will be this year. But I did manage to be able to get some cut on them last year. Now, if you look at my Ito peonies, I have eight of them. And I think uh, I went over last week on my... Uh, flower bed design for this year. You'll see that I've got the eight Ito peonies in these four beds here, and then these three are the deciduous peonies. Now the Ito peonies have really big blooms. They're really beautiful, and these eight are the ones that I'm growing. I have to look at my list because I don't remember their names off the top of my head yet. I know most of my dahlias, and I have more than eight of those, but I don't know the Ito peonies yet. So in the top left, we have strawberry cream, with its beautiful full head of, uh, it's a soft pink. It's a medium, medium toned pink. So it's not light, it's not dark, but it's a nice soft pink. To the right of that, we have Canary Brilliance and the blooms on it aren't consistent from flower head to flower head. You'll see there's some variation in color. So that'll be interesting to see what I get off of that this year. Beneath that is Pink Double Dandy which is very similar to, to strawberry cream at the top left, but pink double dandy is paler in shade and not quite as full of flower head. To the left of that, we have pastel splendor. And pastel splendor is kind of a really, really pale mauvey lavender with that deep, rich burgundy tone in the center of each petal. It's almost like a triangular shape. And then of course the, the yellow center Beneath that, we have Morning Lilac, which is a mid-tone lilac color. It's not a full head. It's, uh, it's a double row of petals, but not a full head. Beside that, on the right, is Bartsella with its beautiful, striking, buttery yellow bloom. That is, even though I'm not uh, a, typically a yellow-flowered person, that is my favorite of the Ito peonies. And I don't think you can get yellow in Deciduous peonies, so uh, that makes it a little bit different, too. 
beside that we have, oh, pardon me, beneath that we have Julia Rose, which is sort of orange and peach in color. And to the left of that, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a lollipop, which of course is also a multicolored, uh, you can see there's like three different blooms on that one bush. One is sort of pale lavender, one is a little orange, and one is a little tangerine in color. Looking forward to seeing what those ones all look like. Now, the other thing that is on my top 10 list is ranunculus. Now, in this particular bouquet, there's one ranunculus. It's that little white, sort of rosy looking flower. And um, it's right in front of the white alium. I also have Bartzella, that beautiful yellow etopiony in there. I have a hostel leaf that is cupping the Bartzella flower. I have some stilby leaves um, around the base of the bouquet as well. And then coming out of the top is a purple bachelor button and a white foxglove. Now the four ranunculus that I grew this year are in the top left we have Pauline which is a really beautiful rich it's it's a reddish maroon um, it's not complete maroon it's slightly redder than that with a little bit of pink undertone to it to the right of that we have Amandine white which was absolutely my favorite it just added that little bit of sparkle in a bouquet beneath that we have Amandine salmon that was came out as really bright orange in my garden. I don't know if it's supposed to because none of the pictures look bright orange, but it did, and it was the least popular out of all of the uh, ranunculus that I grew. In the bottom left-hand corner, you will see Amandine Marshmallow, and that too was, uh, that would be my second favorite next to the white one. And again, white flowers are not my favorite, but it's with the with the uh, ranunculus, that, that little ball of white really had this, the, gave a sense of dancing to the bouquets, which was, uh, which was a nice addition. So next on my list of top 10, and this is the fifth one that I'm bringing up so far, so we're just about halfway through, and on that point, if you have liked what I've done so far, please give this uh, video a thumbs up and subscribe so that you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. So let's carry on. If you can't tell, it's sweet peas. Sweet peas are a real must in my garden and a top favorite of mine because they start blooming really, really early but for me, they continue on straight through the summer to the fall. And partly it's because of the way I plant them. I plant them so that their feet are very, very shaded with other things. So the ground around the base of the sweet pea plant stays much cooler. And I think that allows them to bloom for a much longer length of time than people are accustomed to. Now, a lot of my sweet peas in the earlier part of the season, I cut and do a solid bunches of them and I sell them in either jars or vases. And that is really, really popular right up until my dahlias start. The minute my dahlias start, that's what people want, dahlias. But at that point, I will use the sweet peas in bouquets with the dahlias, just as a little bit of added whimsy, because you know, if you keep the, if you keep the stems nice and long and they poke out the top, they have a lot of movement to them, which adds a little bit of refreshing, non-static appeal. Of course, they have that light scent. I don't plant the ones that are heavily scented, just the lightly scented ones, so that just wafts subtly in the air. And as you can see in this bouquet, it, they just they just add so much of a different kind of textural element to the other things that are in there, which are, in this case, I have my uh, dinner plate dahlias. You can see a Wanda's Capella, which is the bright, big, bold yellow one at the bottom. Above that, I have Thomas Edison, which is the purple one. Um, you can just see tucked in behind a yellow and a fuchsia one, and that would be Lindsay Michelle. I also have several of my pro-cut sunflowers in there. It looks like I have orange on the right. I have a plum sideways on the left, and another plum sort of centered in the bouquet, and some Cosmo foliage as well. So definitely sweet peas are an absolute, absolute must in my garden. Now the next one on my list, number six, is a stilby. A stilby is another absolute must in my garden, even though it is not a focal flower, because a stilby adds, again, so much airiness like the sweet peas. It doesn't give the movement, but it has this beautiful feathery plumage to it that is very visceral. People really want to reach out and touch it. And that makes, makes a whole other dimension to the bouquet, other than the look and the smell, is that touchability factor of it. And I absolutely love astilbies in my bouquets. Now, in this particular bouquet, you'll see that I have an astilbe dead center. Just to the right of it, I have some Russian sage doing additional spiking. 
and on the left of it, I have poppy pods doing another spiking, but in a more architectural way. Then I have some soft little bachelor buttons in various shades poking out through the bouquet. Down um, sort of midway, I it is collared with sunflowers. In this case, there's a red, a white knight, and you can see a lemon just around the other side. <clears throat> Excuse me. And beneath them, I have lace cap hydrangeas. And the foliage that you see is from the sunflowers. Now, I've spoken about my Pro Cut sunflowers a number of times. They are another must grow in my garden, and I like them for many different reasons. The Pro Cuts, it's the only kind that I grow is the Pro Cuts, for, and I grow the Pro Cuts for three reasons. One, they don't lose pollen, they're pollenless, so they don't drip pollen all over your table wherever you have them. That, that's, that's nice because you can, you can damage some things with, uh, with a lot of heavy pollen. The second thing is, is that they come in a wide range of colors, as you can see here in the eight that I'm showcasing. They come in a lot of different colors. And the third thing, which is most important for me, is you can practically customize them. So if you want a four inch flower, you just plant the Pro Cuts four inches apart. If you want a six inch flower, you plant the Pro Cuts six inches apart and so forth and so on. And so what I do is, is earlier on in the season, before my dahlias start blooming, but the sunflowers will be blooming, I have planted them closer to the six inch apart level so that I have some large dramatic flowers in my bouquets. Once the dahlias start blooming, the dinner plates are huge. They're like, you know, 10 plus inches in diameter. I don't need these great big sunflowers. So then those ones will have been planted closer together. So they act as smaller, more decorative, uh, a foil in texture, but they still have that beautiful sunflower appeal. So the eight pro cuts that I'm growing this year, if you look at them in the top left, I have white night. So it's got the white petals around the outside with the dark center, which is why it's called white night. To the right of that, I have lemon chiffon with its lemon petals. Beneath that is plum with its, uh, it's called plum, but a lot of the times the petals have sort of a plummy brownish uh, tone to them, which, which I quite like as well. To the left of that and beneath white night, we have white light. And it's called white light because instead of having the dark center, it's got a light center. Beneath white light, we have, ooh, what's that called? Let me check out my list here again. That is called red lemon. And to the right of red lemon, we have orange. Beneath orange, we have gold light. And then beside that in the very bottom left, we have red. As you can see, gold light and uh, red lemon are new to me this year because I didn't quite have their names down yet. And you can see that, uh, you can, you've seen them in previous flower arrangements, just how dramatic that they truly are. Next on my list of beautiful flowers is the lace cap hydrangea. And here you can see I've got, it cup, the, I've got them cupped around the bottom of the vase. And the reason for that is because they tend to grow kind of scooped, like the, 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 the stems come out of the bush and then they scoop up to the sun because the, 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 the bush is just completely covered in, in the flowers. So for a flower to reach the sun, it kind of has, the stem has to kind of sc scoot outwards. And for that reason, there isn't long straight stems on it. So I have, tend to have much shorter stems on my lace cap hydrangeas. And for that reason, I keep them lower in the bouquet because my taller stems sit higher than them. In this case, I have a uh, Thomas Edison purple hydrangea, uh, pardon, hydrangea um, dinner plate dahlia sitting on them. To the right of that, the white flower is actually a hosta flower. Then I have some uh, bachelor's buttons in their pinks and pale lavenders. I have a few spikes of a different kind of Russian sage. I have a still big plume and lots of poppy pods. Now the really cool thing about lace hydrangea, which is what makes it quite spectacular, is, is it has quite a large flower head and it's surrounded by what looks like little, little four petal flowers, but those aren't actually flowers, those are sepals. The actual flower to the head is all those little beads of blue centered inside those four petaled sepals. And it's quite large, and because of these two completely different textures, it creates quite a bit of shade, quite a bit of sparkle, quite a bit of visceral touching, wanting to touch. And again, that draws a lot of attention, so it is an absolute must in my bouquets as well for that reason. 
Now, after lace cap plain drag changes, and number nine on my list is poppies. Now, I don't grow poppies for the flowers because the, the petals on the flowers, they don't last very long. They only last actually a couple of uh, days in the garden. They really don't last long in a vase at all. So I enjoy the flowers blooming in my garden. And then as soon as all the petals fall off of them, then you've got these beautiful structural architectural green poppy pods. And that's what I use in my bouquets. And you'll, you'll have seen that I use them in quite a few of the ones that I was showing already. And they are an absolute must as well in my garden. I can never have enough of them. And finally, 10th on my list of top 10 cut flowers is, of course, my dinner plate dahlias. And in this particular vase, you can see that I've got Lindsay Michelle in the front <clears throat> with its yellow and fuchsia petals. I have Spartacus tucked in beneath in the shadows, which is a really deep, dark red. I have AC Loomis just off to the left, sort of pointing upwards, but slightly in the background. And it's kind of a beautiful crimsony color with a little frosting of white around its petals. And then there is a decorative dahlia called Edinburgh off to the left. In between AC Loomis and Edinburgh, you can see some Queen Lime series uh, zinnias. And then for foliage, I have uh, Cosmos because by this time my still bees have finished. This bouquet was created on September 2nd. And then there's some green leaf foliage off to the right that you can see, which actually comes from a sunflower there that's tucked in. That's hard to see the sunflower. And the top eight dinner plate dahlias that <clears throat> I grow, excuse me, I've been having a little bit of trouble with my voice this week because I have a bit of laryngitis, so sorry about the roughness of my voice. The top eight uh, dinner plate dahlias that I grew last year was in the top left, we have Spartacus. I've talked about that where it has, it's a, it shows, it's not showing through the color in this picture. The sunlight must've been shining on it when I took it, but it's actually quite a deep, dark, rich red. A shadow color. It looks really, really good with autumn colors in the fall, but it also looks awesome paired with bright pinks in the summer. To the right of that is Lindsay Michelle, which has that sort of yellow circular donut shape, and then the outside of the petals are fuchsia. And the petals, if you can see it or not, I don't know, it's sort of got like a, a split tongue petal, so that, and that's called a lacinated petal, and that adds a little bit of interesting movement and texture and uh, whimsy to, to that particular flower as well. Beneath that is Labyrinth and just a multitude shades of peach and salmon and its petals kind of do a little bit of twisting and curling again for some more movement and interesting shape to that particular dahlia. To the left of that is Wanda's Capella. That's a yellow one. Again, it's one of my favorite. It was the first dahlia that I grew. I was given three tubers by uh, somebody that I knew and I put, planted them in my front garden. I thought they were beautiful. People were stopping by. It brought so many smiles to people's faces, just like faces, pardon me, looking through our fence at these three plants, telling me stories about dahlias. That's, at that point, I realized the power of the flower, literally, just those three plants and how much joy they brought to people. And it was at that point I decided I was going to start growing flowers. Uh, at, at cut flowers for bouquets, etc. Anyway, beneath that we have Wanda's Aurora with, with the yellow center and the outward leaves are sort of uh, brownie salmon, which makes them good both for the summer uh, bouquets as well as for the fall. Beside that is AC Loomis. It's sort of a crimsony fuchsia color with, and with a white frosting on the tips of its petals. Beneath that we have AC Ben which is a nice soft orange, again, just perfect for fall bouquets. And to the left of that, we have tartan. And tartan is interesting because you never quite know how those striations of deep purple are gonna show up on the white petals. Sometimes it's almost almost all purple with just a few little white strips in it. Other times it's almost all white with just a few little streaks of purple in it. So, and that can, that's all within the same plant. So it's not, it's not true in its pattern, but it's truly a beautiful flower and quite unique. So those are my top 10 flowers. Did you notice how many were perennials or how many were annuals? If you did, let me know in the comments section below. Now, I did mention in the beginning, I was going to show you how, uh, to talk to you about how I grow my daffodils and tulips as cut flowers. And I do that by planting three bulbs of one kind in a one gallon pot. I put them all aside. Just one sec. <clears throat> Here we go. 
I put them all aside until they start blooming. This was April 9th of last year. We brought the flower wagon up to the road at that time because I was just starting to get some blooming. I have uh, Orange Emperor is the only tulip that was blooming because that's a really, really early blooming tulip and the rest are daffodils and there isn't that many on there yet. But within a week, that flower wagon will be loaded with daffodils mostly. And again, on April 19th is when the I started doing bouquets using the camellias. So, you know, in another two weeks, I'll be bursting at the seams. Come May 1st, I'll actually have to add a second table to this where I start selling my extra daily tubers as well. So this is the first day of the season. I don't have a lot to sell yet, but it's it's letting the cars coming by you know, oh, she's open. And, and the sales start happening pretty quickly after that first day. First day, none, because people are driving by and um, going, oh, she's open, but they don't necessarily have the, um, I just use, I have a cash box on there, on her system. And um, people have to bring cash with them when they're buying them. I'm not out there to collect uh, anything from them. It just goes into the little pay here box that's on the side that you can see that, that little white box. It's keyed so nobody can uh, open it up and take money out of it. All right, so that's it. That's my top 10 cut flowers. That's how I do my daffodils and tulips. If you enjoyed this video, again, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss the next videos. If you haven't seen the three things that you should do before you start planting seeds, please check back on those videos. And next week, come back and join me while we discuss the cut flowers that I'm absolutely not growing again this year. Until then, bye.